Now, there was a mention, Matt, uh, in the chat about Caleb Williams possibly winning back-to-back -back Heisman. So my question for you is, you know, we most recently saw Bryce Young with the opportunity, and we've seen this more in recent years because used, that used to be a senior award for the most part going decades back. And that was the send off into the NFL for those particular players. But now we're seeing more and more players with the opportunity to win a second Heisman. And I won't say falling short. They certainly didn't win the award. But in the case of the most recent Bryce Young, he had an exceptional season. His team did not uh, ascend to the level that it's accustomed to and reach the playoffs, put him on the big stage. And so it was perceived to be a bit of a down year, not necessarily again for him. Didn't have the best receivers uh, in uh, 2022. And so he didn't complete the trick. So my, my question for you, Matt, is in addition to Caleb Williams, obviously having to perform up to his standard, do you think there's a bias for, do you think there tends to be, and it depends on the voter, a bias in favor of the former Heisman winner that's defending or against them, meaning that there's could be one uh, line of thinking that, well, he's won the Heisman. He, you know, he's already on the stage. He's already in the spotlight. You know, we know who he is. We expect uh, a great level of play and kind of looking it through the filter of this is a Heisman trophy winner and giving him a bit of a smidge of an advantage in people's minds and seeing more there than maybe is already there. Or because he won the Heisman, there are higher expectations. He needs to be better this year. He can't just, you know, if he threw 42 touchdowns last year, uh, there's no way we can allow him to throw less than that because then he's got a downgraded season. He has to do even more to back up his Heisman and win two consecutive years. Well, Mark, you're a college football historian, and you're also someone who is steeped in the knowledge of Ohio State football in particular. Like, I know that's one of the schools that you focus on a lot. You're definitely a Buckeye expert. You know, as well as I do, and a lot of older fans, older college football fans and observers uh, as well, you know that when Archie Griffin won the second Heisman in 1975, that a lot of people thought that Chuck Muncie of Cal deserved that award. And so there was there was a lot of uh, dissatisfaction. And it was it was unsettling for a lot of people that Archie Griffin got those back to back Heismans when many people felt, well, he shouldn't have won uh, each of them. And I think the fact that or the fact the reality that, you know, that 75 Heisman was so controversial uh, for Archie Griffin, like even now, people will say that, you know, it should have gone to Chuck Muncie. You know, that that Archie Griffin, you know, obviously one of the all time greats in college football, but nevertheless still shouldn't have won back to back Heisman's that has left a mark in terms of back to back Heisman trophy winners. So I do think that the memory of 1975 and the awareness of that part of the Heisman story and the Heisman history. So, like, if we're going to give it back to back to somebody again, it needs to be right. It, we, we need to be absolutely sure that there's no alternative. So I definitely do think that, that there has become, and appropriately so, I might add, uh, really a lot of caution in terms of giving the Heisman uh, to the same player back to back. If, you, if you're going to win it back to back, if you're going to get that very rare distinction in the history of college football, you need to break the door down. You need to bust it down. You need to leave all doubt. And so I think the natural uh, point of emphasis for Caleb Williams is that USC schedule is a beast. We've talked about that on the Voice of College Football. You know, once the schedule came out and you, you have that five-week gauntlet from October 14th through mid-November, Notre Dame, Utah, Washington, Oregon, uh, uh, UCLA. Uh, so all those tough teams, the biggest, most important opponents on the schedule, all within a, a, a five-week span. If Caleb Williams knocks down all of those opponents, wins all of those games, leads USC to the playoff against that really nasty schedule, he, he will have a case. And then if USC doesn't get to the playoff, it's probably not going to happen. Like that, that's just the way these things work, right? Like it's 
the Heisman Trophy, like it or not, and I don't like it, uh, has become the award for quarterback on a college football playoff team. Now, people will say, oh, USC didn't make the playoff uh, this past season. But Caleb Williams was so obviously better than everybody else. And C.J. Stroud had his chance in that spotlight game against Michigan. Didn't do it. Max Duggan didn't make the huge closing argument uh, against Kansas State. Uh, and, you know, Stetson Bennett, like he it was clear that Stetson Bennett was the Ken Dorsey Miami of this Georgia team that he fit into that role. You know, really good game manager, made all the plays that needed to be made. But like you, you can't compare him to Caleb Williams in terms of overall uh, numbers and just dynamism on the field. So it, it really became clear that it was Caleb Williams, if only by process of elimination. The Hendon Hooker injury certainly had a lot to do with the dynamics of this award. You know, if Hooker had remained healthy, and let's say that Tennessee uh, gets into the clubhouse at 11 and 1, beats, beats South Carolina with Hooker playing the whole way in that game, you know, I, I it would have been a real debate between Caleb Williams and Hendon Hooker. But when he went down, like that, that knocked down to me, the guy who I thought was the favorite. Uh, heading into uh, that next to last weekend or the next the, the the weekend before Thanksgiving uh, in the college football season. So it became Caleb Williams by really process of elimination. Uh, not so much. I mean, part, it, you could say that Caleb Williams transcended everybody, but it was also the field regressed late in the season for, for, you know, a, a variety of reasons. Uh, but in, in 2023, Caleb Williams really is going to have to transcend. He's going to just going to have to soar above everyone else so that there's just no doubt. If there is doubt, and especially if the main uh, contender or two comes from a prestigious blue blood or, or high-end football school, it's probably going to go the other way. And USC fans might say that that's unfair, but that Archie Griffin memory from 1975 – it really has affected, in my mind, uh, the decisions of Heisman voters. And and while I think that Heisman voting has been awful for a very long time, like Hendon Hooker not being uh, a finalist and Stetson Bennett being a finalist, like that's a joke. And you can find pretty much at least one outrage on a pretty consistent basis over the past 10, 15 years. Um, while the one thing that Heisman voters have gotten right is that they haven't given the award to back-to-back -back guys, you know, when there's been any real question or any real debate uh, about the matter, that's the one thing Heisman voters have been able to consistently get right. I think, it, you know, if you are going to give this uh, prestigious award to the same guy twice, boy, it better be clear cut. And uh, the Heisman has not repeated the mistake of Archie Griffin uh, in 1975. And also consider uh, that Blake Corum, uh, was knocked out uh, early uh, in the yes. game against uh, Illinois, the penultimate uh, game would have been of a the finalist. season. Uh, so he missed the second half of the Illinois game, the Ohio State game, and the Big Ten Championship game, two and a half games, and he was the leading running back candidate at that point. And, and like you, Hendon Hooker was my guy at the point at which he went down. And then, of course, Caleb Williams took off from there. Uh, interesting notes about the Archie Griffin 1975 season to cap off that part of it is that first and foremost, of course, he was in the spotlight playing for a blue blood Ohio state. As you mentioned, they were also 11 and 0 and number one in the country. That doesn't hurt when you're presumed to be the national champion. Now they ran into UCLA at the Rose bowl and were upset and cost them the national title, but they were consensus number one and headed to the Rose bowl at 11 and 0 and uh, people might be shocked to hear this statistic in that particular Heisman season of 1975. Can anybody out there guess how many touchdowns Archie Griffin scored that year? I don't know, by the way, he scored four rushing touchdowns Four. Pete Johnson, who, you know, well, <laughs> Pete Johnson, who was a bruising back, scored 25 touchdowns. Now, the first 
thought that anybody who's familiar with Pete Johnson laid later played for the Cincinnati Bengals, big bruising, like 250 pound fullback was, well, he just, he just busted in the end zone from the one or two yard line. You would think that Archie Griffin ran for roughly 1,450 yards, something in that range. Pete Johnson ran for well over a thousand yards. He was at like a thousand seventy. You, you could have handed the Heisman trophy to Pete Johnson. <laughs> Not that he deserved it. I'm not making that argument, but I'm just saying. That's true. (laughs) But that's a staggering fact about Archie Griffin's rushing touchdowns. My word. Uh, Hard to believe. Uh, But, you know, it's it's worth remembering how different a game football was back then. Like, you know, I I do remember when uh, Ken Stabler died, like there were reflections on his career and uh, uh, his football legacy. Like I looked up Ken Stabler's interception totals like – the dude threw a ton of interceptions and yet like we all regard him as a great quarterback and oh, he absolutely. was, oh, he yeah. was a great quarterback. And yet he threw stacks of interceptions. It was just a very different sport in the 1970s. Yeah. His NFL total was something in the 180 to 225 <laughs> range career, really close to that. Something in that range, you know, uh, I, I don't want to take us completely off the rails, but it reminds me that uh, Fran Tarkington, one of my favorite all-time quarterbacks, because he was retiring. He, I watched him basically play two seasons at my very earliest memories of football. And of course, he was a fading star, but still slinging it for the Minnesota Vikings. His final year with the Vikings, like he set all the all-time records in regards to attempts and completions because they were they were a good team but not a really good team so he had to like chuck it all the time he and he threw 32 picks that year and uh, uh i saw a video that uh there's an nfl channel here on youtube that does outstanding historical work but uh i i was very familiar with this but i wanted to see the exact totals and so forth they were making a play for the 1976 Actually, John McKay's 77 Buccaneers, to be more exact, even though they were the team that won two games after they were uh, winless. I went 14 the year before. They actually had a worse offense in 1977. And their collective quarterbacks, uh, they started like four different quarterbacks. They threw three touchdowns (laughs) and 30 interceptions that year. (laughs) Steve Spurrier was one of those quarterbacks, if I'm not mistaken. Absolutely, he was. Absolutely. Great stuff. Who is also part of the Heisman story, of course, and is the only guy to win it as a player and then win it as a coach. Yes, he was. I guess I didn't put that together. I would have had to go through the various lists of the two to string that one together. I'd be curious to see to see Tim Tebow's uh, 2008 numbers because I, I know that they were pretty staggering. He, of course, won in 07. But Florida was a nine and three regular season team, so he didn't come close to a national championship. But for a guy that has two national championship rings, albeit he was not the starting quarterback the first time, he comes back, wins a national championship as a Heisman Trophy winner, but does not win it um, as Sam Bradford won it in 08. 